who has his hand up? Kim. Sorry, Cheryl, just letting you know I'm here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Nice to know you're there, despite the fact that we can't see your smiling face. Um, we've still got a couple of council laws on their way, I would imagine. Uh, Councillor Go Lightly, I don't see. Councillor. Murphy. It is really pretty well everybody except Jane. So we've got uh, three, four items on our briefing today and uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read through all of the documentation that goes with our briefing and the first one is two, item 2.1 uh, the 2020-21 transportation activity update and Kelvin is the author of that. Kelvin are you going to talk us through this? Uh, through the chair, yes ma'am, um, I'll take the paper as read but just probably highlight a couple of key points. Um, so this is the uh, latest quarterly update but also doubles as the year-end review of transport activities. Um, it covers off both the um, activities on the improvement plan for the NTA as an organisation which are progressing well and the actual delivery of the transport program. Um, probably some of the key highlights really relate to um, what's previously been discussed about a record program not only in, in um, Whangarei but also right across Northland delivered. Um, so the, the Whangarei expenditure delivered was up 40% on previous year um, and 53% across the um, region so over 140 million um, expended on local roads in Northland last year. Um, pleasingly we were able to um, really maximise our subsidy uptake with um, just on 94%, sorry, 94.8% um, taken. And um, with with that, it means we've been able to, um, as well as that, sorry, we've been able to carry over some of the unclaimed subsidy through to the next year. So a large portion was the emergency works of 1.4 million and that's been carried through. So that hasn't been lost. Um, probably, from a, another perspective, and Jeff's just joining us, our asset management and strategy team are working through kind of we've we've completed the obviously the AMP for the 21-24 program and now we're working on some of the um, underlying strategies and policies associated with that around one network framework, um, consolidation of our RAM databases um, and our procurement strategy. Um, the Refresh transportation procurement strategy was approved by Waka Katahi in June, um, and that's required to support all our subsidy uptake. Um, and really, every th the only other point I just wanted to highlight is the um, success of the Titai Tukarau um, Worker Reader Employment Program um, that has really um, pleasantly surprised both ourselves and MB. The original target was to employ 50. Um, people who'd been um, displaced through to COVID. Um, at our latest count, we employed 111. We were concerned about ongoing employment given that the program was a six to nine month program and um, pleasingly 93% um, or over 100 of those who were redeployed um, have gone on to um, continuous employment with those they um, those who employed them, oh. um, which is a massive um, positive outcome. Um, we're just working with the contractors at the moment to understand if there's been any negative impact through this latest lockdown on those employment numbers. And then we'll be um, working with MB to put out a regional press release about the, the program. But obviously the, the timing of the latest lockdown um, has, has got a bit of hesitancy around that. Um, and half the fun, over half the funding went to locally owned Northland businesses as well, which was, uh, I think the target was 40%. So, so yeah, so that's really the key highlights. Just any questions? Oh, thanks, Kelvin. Councillors, any questions for Kelvin or Jeff, as you noted? Councillor Cooper. Thanks very much, Kelvin, for that. Um, and it's good to see the expenditure go up. But uh, one of the questions that sort of one of the things that worries me is um, 
the extra money that we've spent, how much of that would be on the same work, just costing more? Do you know what I mean? As opposed to further work. If uh, if you do, you have a sort of a, a bit of a handle on that, please. Uh, yeah, through the chair, uh, it, I don't have exact figures. Um, a large proportion of our work is delivered through the maintenance contracts, um, and those have fixed rates with annual escalation applied. So, um, in in those cases, the 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 work that's been done um, is is uh, an increase of work to be done. Noting that this year's program, part of the reason it was as high as it was, it was almost a perfect storm in the fact that we had some significant carry forwards from um, the last quarter of last year um, with the COVID impact. We had a already large year three of an NLTP program and then we had additional MB funding on top. Um, so there, there was significantly more work to done be done. Just to give an idea, um, we across the region, we did um, 17 and a half kilometres of seal extensions, 270 kilometres of reseals on 500 sites, 18 kilometres of rehabs, um, 46 new footpaths or shared paths, um, 43 safety projects. Um, so there was there was significant actual physical work done. Um, so yeah. seventy odd million of the hundred and forty million was was capital project expenditure. So um, there was some some new stuff done. That's great. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. <clears throat> the seventeen and a half of uh, kilometres of seal extension is great. And I just sort of um, I guess we're going, we're looking forward to um, with that funding announcement. It, hopefully our our program for next year's seal extension can be. Uh, Look at pretty soon, and we can decide what we're doing and how we're doing it. It'll be it'll be great to see some progress on that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Hulse. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. The um, I just want to ask a couple of questions. And the first one doesn't relate to Calvin, but uh, when we set the Norton Transport Alliance up, there's a promise that we'd receive about three million dollar dividend a year. The cows got diverted into new activities. I've yet to see a report where that went to. I'm just reminding Councillor, we've, some of us councillors have got our memory, because uh, Councillor Christie at the time and myself, both former chairman of the Infrastructure Committee, know if you make promises, you should be able to deliver on them. And so that is our concern. So that's one question. Um, I know you can't do much about it now, but it's just quite intriguing that uh, this is how you, what you use to get things across the line and then don't deliver on them. Uh, through, the, through the chair, just responding to that question of Councillor yeah. Hulse, there was a benefits assessment paper of the NTA provided to Council, I think it was mid last year, um, which showed that the benefits being provided uh, were in line with the best estimate of the business case. It still, it still doesn't answer the question. Um, it, it attempts to. The original promise was to come back to council for council identify new works to do. Not, no, councillor. Yeah. Sorry, councillor. That's that's not correct. The, the the document said that there would be an additional sum of money freed up by efficiencies, which would be reinvested into the roading network. And I'll recirculate the paper which shows that happened. Um, and it was it was pretty good. It was better than we'd expected. So that um, that promise has well and truly been fulfilled. Well, let's let's send a report out, and I'll come back and explain where it's not fulfilled. But anyway, moving on, it's, I was going to ask. It is good that Councillor Cooper uh, just uh, asked the question I was going to ask. So ask anyway about the uh, amount of investment and the return we get. You know, the dollars per kilometre now. Because the contracts are now exceeding our our extension and contracts, because the increase in cost on a Pacific job is too costly now, and we've got to really scrutinise that now. So. Uh, through the chair, just to clarify, the contract extensions that um, I know one was put forward to council last last month, um, those are a result of an additional work done through the maintenance contracts. So the initial maintenance contracts were based on standard maintenance activities. Mm -hmm. Through last year, we facilitated the MB projects and the likes through those contracts. Um, and that is why those, those um, funding levels got increased. Um, we are confident that the work being done is reflective of, is, is not reducing as a result of increased costs. 
it's in line with escalation. Um, we do know, however, that there's supply chain issues moving forward that may have an impact on what we're able to complete with the funding. Um, but the activities being completed uh, are stepping up in line with the funding. Yeah, and just one final question. Have you got any idea of how much, well, I suppose you would have an idea, how many roads we've actually had to take over after, you know, the initial three years from subdivisions? Because, you know, like a Totra Grove and all those, and all those roads come in. How many extra kilometres are we actually maintaining now? Jeff, are you able to answer that question? Um, uh, uh, we, we record that in our system on an annual basis. I can find that figure out and give it to you, um, uh, provide it to the councillors, but it is uh, considerable over the last few years, but we make allowance for that in our asset management plan. So our asset management plan allows for growth of our network and our, our request for budgets are uh, based accordingly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for those uh, comments. Simon, you had your hand, Simon Weston, um, had your hand up. Has that been dealt with? Uh, I was just going to make the comment that um, uh, I was the person that was providing councils with the updates uh, during the uh, formation of the NTA and throughout all of the reports that we provided all the councils in Northland, we said that the money would be reinvested back into the roading program and uh, that was unanimously supported so that's just answering that question um, and just in another matter that was raised um, I raised with uh, Steve Mutton uh, of Waka Kotahi um, uh, earlier this week buying power and how the uh, increase in budget for the next three years compares against the last three years in terms of buying power and um, also the influence that the bitumen issue is going to have on that. Um, they said that they were working on that, but he didn't have any numbers for me. So I'm hoping that um, when they uh, they present to a briefing in the future, that they'll actually have those sorts of answers. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Councillor Cocorillo. Sorry, Madam Chair, I'm just double checking uh, with, with, the, with the report that Calvin uh, and Simon just presented there, that goes down all the way down. Um, does it include page 17? Because I want to ask a question about page 17 if it was OK. That is part of the um, report on the yep. to type it. Yep. OK, uh, it, it just in relation to the roadside clearing when the trees. Everyone loves the look of trees and the well, they always look great. Um, Ostroads have a standard which says that trees are to come up, uh, be not be planted against the side of the road uh, as for possible to fall on the road. Again, when you're dealing with Australia, you're dealing with gum trees which do break limbs regularly. With our uh, roads in around Northland, we are getting a lot of trees being planted close to the road. What is the policy or what, what are we doing about uh, that if we're going to have then have contractors going out there doing roadside clearing. So I'll, I'll just answer quickly about the roadside clearing we completed. So um, majority of that roadside clearance was Wilding Point, um, the, the self seeded. Um, but Jeff may be able to respond regarding the policy itself. Yeah, so in the rural area nowadays, we require permission from from us for anybody wishes to plant trees or hedges in the berm that's on the council roading berm. Uh, there are obviously heaps of uh, natural growing and even some planted trees historically that, that cause us problem. Um, as you can imagine, taking out a tree on a public road can be an extremely expensive activity with the health and safety requirements. So we only we have a process we've developed with parks in line with the um, district plan rules on roadside on trees, uh, where we we have an assessment of trees and if they're deemed dangerous, then we take them out. So th there's a process we go through, but we don't go out deliberately clearing roadsides. Possibly we should, but we don't have the funding. In terms of the urban area, council has a street trees policy that does allow planting of 
trees and berms, but they are uh, proved, they are appropriate um, tree species. Um, and there are some that are not, and we take those out as we can, as we are required to, and as funding allows. Just through the through the chair, sorry, Vince, with with this um, MB program across um, Wakate and and the three district councils, we were provided with nearly two and a half, ah, uh, sorry, three and a half million dollars for actively um, reducing roadside tree issues. Now that's three and a half million that we wouldn't have had in our normal budgets. And what it enabled us to do was actually go through in a lot of corridors and remove trees that were potentially going to be a nuisance in the future as well. So um, it, it allowed us a bit more flexibility in terms of what we were able to do. Part of MB's funding requirements were that we weren't able to undertake activities that were already funded within the next 18 months. So this was more a long term view of, of tree clearance. So it's really basically maintenance of existing assets, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So will this funding continue going or is it that was it? No, uh, through the chair, this was a one off piece of funding for Titai Tukarau, that 9.3 million. Um, they added 2 million for WDC and 2 million for Far North for the storm response, um, but it was specifically related to that worker redeployment post COVID. I, I do I do have concerns about the, the trees being planted next to the road, as Council is well aware, um, it's, it's, even in the urban area when I'm seeing trees being damaging up at the Council assets regularly. Um, the other question I had was in relation to uh, Memorial Drive was, uh, and your councillors can see pictures of that on, on page 20, but I'm, I'm more wondering how is the uh, the slips going around Whangarei because there's still quite a lot of slip damage which still hasn't been repaired for example High Street and I was looking at those sort of projects so were any of those things going to be looked at? Uh, so through the chair um, those are when I was mentioning previously about the subsidised funding that's been carried forward. So those are part of that subsidised funding, that emergency works response. Um, so they are still um, being worked through. There was a significant amount of damage that is being designed and repaired, and um, but the funding is still there to finish those jobs. Thanks, Kelvin. Councillor Holtz. No, I'm fine with that. I must, I'll take my oh. hand down. <laughs> thank you. It, it's, thank you. Uh, any other queries on this update? That's a couple. Um, I haven't been able to open the report this, today, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, I did read it last night, but I had a question, Calvin, around the worker redeployment issue, and I'm really sorry I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but I thought when I read it that you had about, I don't know, 250 or something, of which I thought something like 120 had already been in work, and then we managed to place about that sort of number in full-time work. So I was just checking really whether people who we had picked up who had been formerly unemployed actually went on to yep. permanent full-time work or whether it was people who effectively um, were being redeployed, if you know what I mean. Yep. So so through the chair, Sorry, just to, the no, that's all right. Just to clarify, I've got that piece in front of me. Um, so the original targets were... Um, to engage 165 minimum of 165 people on the project and 50 of those needed to be um, what was classed as um, impacted by COVID so they'd lost their jobs. Um, what we ended up doing was engaging at least 294 and of those 111 were ones that were unemployed at the time. Now of those 111, 103 have continued through to permanent employment. So if I can, just of the 111, were they formally unemployed or were, had they been 
made unemployed because of the impact of COVID. If you see, if you see yep. the difference. So, so the the target of this program was for those who were made unemployed as a result of COVID. Um, now we weren't specific with that. So if MSD provided someone who was suitable that had was long term unemployed, then we weren't going to say no, obviously. Um, I do know that, um, for example, in NRC's component of the, I think at least half of their 12 were long term unemployed. Um, and of their 12, 10 continued on to um, full time employment. Yeah, um, the, the other, the other great thing about this was that um, nearly every one of those 111 have come out with upskill training, which range from basic first aid CPR training through to a lot of them got level two um, horticulture, chainsaw use, um, NZQA formal qualifications, and um, in some cases, STMS and traffic management qualifications. So. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I was about I was going to comment after this that I think in, in a lot of ways, some, as much as unemployment, the qualifications are at, at least as beneficial. And particularly I saw in the report there were a couple of level four qualifications for agriculture and something else, which is, you know, quite getting into quite high level. So those are the those things are what makes employment stick for people. So yeah, all, all good. I was just trying to work out the difference between people who'd recently lost their jobs because of COVID and long-term unemployed and whether it had actually soaked up some LTU people. So that's really good. Thank you. And I'm sorry I haven't got the report. Tricia, um, it may help in the calendar item. There is a link to the agenda in the in the item, so it might help you open it. Yes, no, I've Peters. tried that too. Oh, Thank no. Councillor Peters. Um, I want to add my endorsement um, to the team for for what they've done for uh, unemployed people and getting this, them into jobs and with qualifications. That is an amazing and wonderful job. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Peters. Um, would, so, would somebody be able to send uh, Councillor Cutforth the link to the um, e scribe meeting? Thing? Sending now. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on the comprehensive report? I was just going to say the reports are on the council website as well. Yeah. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, well done, Calvin. It's pretty good results all round there. Um, just on the question of bitumen costs, just working numbers through in my head with you know, um, new seal and the approximation of 400k per kilometre type scenario as a costing, well, ballpark costing. Do you have any idea now that we are having to import all our bitumen and particularly the cost? involved because it's travelling through from Tauranga to the north. Um, what percentage of increase? I have heard bandied around 340%, but man, that seems awfully high. Do you have any um, costing on that increase? Uh, through the chair, we've, we've, we're in conversations at the moment with our contractors about the potential cost impact that, as you pointed out, the, the primary driver of any cost impact is going to be the increased freight um, coming from Mount Maunganui as opposed to um, Port, um, Marsden Point. Um, the, it's what Kotahi on a national level are looking at options and in discussions with the refinery about longer term options. However, we, we do anticipate some form of cost impact this year. Um, it is definitely not 340%. Um, it depends on, I, I guess the percentages depends on what you're measuring it against. It may be, and, and I'm only surmising here, 340% increase of cartage as opposed to a 340 total percent just because of the kilometres travelled. Um, but we've set up a working group with Waka Kotahi um, maintenance and procurement teams. Um, Jeff, myself and Scott Verivis are involved in discussions with them um, 
to make sure a that that contractually we understand the approach and the approach is consistent um, for for any bitumen costs, but also to make sure that the the any agreement with the contract is a fair and reasonable, and then understanding what impacts that has on any funding. Uh, if I can just come back to you on that, no, the that three hundred and forty percent that was bandied around, or the possibility of it being that, was the price difference between what we were getting it from when it was produced at Marsden Point to what it was going to cost us um, importing and ex Tauranga. Okay, uh, through the chair, then, then um, I do not believe that to be the case at all. Um, previously, while refinery were producing it, there was, there is, there was still imported bitumen being used in New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't, the, oh, Jeff's got his hand up, so maybe he can answer now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the, the request, we've only, we've only had an informal request so far from the contractors. The request is about two or three hundred dollars a tonne of cartage. So the price of bitumen hasn't changed significantly because, as Calvin said, the market in New Zealand supplied by what was um, provided at the refinery and what was imported. Um, and so that market is was always generally the same. But the, for, for Northland, particularly, the, the difference for us is additional um, cartage cost on top of the price at Tauranga. And that's about the talking about two or three hundred dollars a ton. So as Calvin said, uh, NZTA are looking at two things for us. We were working together. One is whether they actually entitled to claim um, those additional costs or whether they are their own internal supply problems because they did tender a, a rate a rate for us. And the rate, the tendered rate includes some uh, cost fluctuations of bitumen. So we pay the international bitumen or oil price that's included. The other issue they're looking at is whether or not they can look at a um, a, st a, a new storage facility at the refinery for imported bitumen. And if that was the case and whether that was jointly owned or um, the, or some other operate option would then enable bitumen supply for Northland to be um, again made from refinery. So those things are still being worked through and we're working closely with NZTA who want to have a response to the contractors on a national basis because we are because all the contractors we're dealing with are all national contractors in New Zealand. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. That's pretty much where I was hoping you were heading. Just aware that that's a highly specialised transportation system and it's very expensive, so we need to get on to it. Thanks, Simon. Are there any other questions for the team on this item? Cool. Um, Let's move then to item 2.2, uh, water supply bylaw review. So we've got Andrew and I saw Vita is also on the, the call for this meeting. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Good morning, councillors. Yes, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, just share my screen, so hopefully you can see that. Yes, we can. Um, Thanks. And we, I'll just provide a, a brief sort of update. Um, I believe you've been going through um, a number of bylaws with, with other departments, so I guess the process is, is reasonably familiar. Um, water supply bylaws are a long-standing bylaw. Um, it's been around for well over 20 years. Various re revisions. Um, under the Local Government Act, we're required to review it every 10 years, and the um, <clears throat> most recent review was in 2012, uh, hence we need to do it uh, this year and get it approved uh, by next year. Um, so the bylaw is, is is the way we manage pretty much everything we do in terms of our interactions uh, with the public and what they can and can't do with the water supplies. So it is a pretty important document for us. Uh, current documents work pretty well. Um, we're pretty pleased with it, um, so we're not going to recommend any any major changes. 
Um, and um, this briefing is really an opportunity for councillors if, if they have any concerns or issues that they'd like to raise. Um, now's a good time and we can work through those before we um, present a, a, a formal draft to council in a statement of proposal. So um, what the bylaw covers, uh, it basically details the responsibility of, of both council and the consumers uh, with respect to the water supply. It provides pretty clear guidelines that are there to protect public health uh, and the security of the water supply. Uh, it, it details the different types of water supply that we have and, and how they're um, provided, uh, mechanisms for the recovery of costs, which is obviously pretty important. Um, it provides guidelines um, around wastage of water and demand management, particularly during drought scenarios. And it provides details of breaches and offences um, and dispute procedures uh, if, if we need to, um, uh, if we have a public disputes. Um, so, as I said, there's no, not proposing any major changes. Um, uh, the, the things that have happened since the last bylaw is that uh, you'll probably remember a couple of years ago in the last drought, um, we put a paper to council requesting that the CE be authorised to impose and lift water restrictions, which was passed by council. So we made a, a little change to the bylaw to reflect that. Um, the estimating of water accounts is something that um, we still do from time to time, but we do it in relation uh, or with the agreement of the customers and work with them on that. Whereas the, under the old bylaw, it was something that we were sort of allowed to do independently. So we've, we've adjusted that slightly. Um, and the permits for the issuing uh, for the use of fire hydrants, is, which is something we've done um, for a long time, but it's, there was nothing in the Bible that allowed us to withdraw a, a permit once it had been issued. So we just tidied up that little loose end there because uh, occasionally we might need to do that. And then the, the rest of it is really just minor sort of clarifications, definitions and um, a, a few minor um, sort of wording changes. Um, so the next steps, really, um, you're invited to, to provide any feedback um, over the next month or so as, as we go through a more detailed review and finalise uh, our recommendations. What we want to do is we want to want to send it to some legal advisors as well. Obviously, we want to make sure that there's nothing in there that uh, is uh, illegal for us to have and make sure we're complying with best practice in terms of bylaws. Um, we'll then present a statement of proposal to council. Um, and uh, obviously, if that's approved, we'll then go through a public consultation process as with the other bylaws and hopefully get it adopted uh, sometime in the middle of uh, next year. The only thing I'd like to add is that the, the bylaw is based on the model general bylaw um, and it follows it reasonably closely in terms of the, the, the information that's in there, although we have tweaked it a little bit to, to suit our purposes. So um, any questions? Thanks, Andrew. I just have one just to, to begin with. In the draft, uh, the draft bylaw, I'm looking at on page 43 of the agenda, it's got Wilson's Dam and the Faux Valley Dam having um, just some wording in red. So is the, the version that we're looking at the, the proposed um, changed model or is that... Um, Yep, that, that is the proposed change model and um, we did review the, the legal status of the various properties that make up those two catchments and so that's probably why that has appeared there in, in red just to um, uh, highlight that we've, um, we've updated that information slightly. Cool, I expect nothing less than thorough checking of legal things. Thanks Andrew. Um, Councillors, questions? Councillor Cockerillo? Thank you, Your My question, Andrew, is more in relation to the um, actual bylaw itself. You've mentioned in the, in the summary that there is a there's no conflicts at the present moment with the with the government system. However, with the three water program and the possible enforcement or compulsory joining of the three waters proposal, how will that affect our bylaws? I mean, that's yet to be decided. There, there will be legislation that uh, would be required for a new entity to exist, and that entity would have certain rights and obligations. Um, whether that entity will be able to make 
uh, and enforce bylaws or whether that would still have to come through the local authority or whether they have the ability to um, have terms and conditions as part of their supply agreements would, would all need to be worked through um, and will be part of that legislation. Um, I was particularly keen to get this through before um, before then so that there was no ambiguity around what, what council are doing and we don't end up with a little bit of a, a, a sort of a, uh, a hiatus between two bits of legislation. So I'm, I'm quite keen to, to make sure we're very clear on, on council's roles and responsibilities uh, you know, over the next few years and potentially beyond, of course. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, any Councillor Hawks? Yeah, just uh, Andrew, if you ask a question, in the schedule on page 43, you still got the ownership of the Hickorangi Dam and the Takahiwai Dam, two of the dams we've decommissioned. Uh, is there any point of having a discussion around it of flicking those off and, and not having them in our schedule? Uh, that the that is certainly a discussion that we'll need to to have with the councillors at, at some point. Um, I am preparing um, a little bit of work to be done with all of the land holdings of water services, um, and there will need to be some decisions made um, depending on obviously what happens with with new entities as to um, the future of those various land holdings um, and where they best sit going forward. Um, so basically, it, it's very much front of mind that that needs to be done, uh, and we will be coming back to councillors uh, at some point um, with some uh, suggestions and options in, in that regard. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question and your response, Andrew. Any other feedback? I can't see any hands up. Well, if you wouldn't mind putting your hand down again that way. Yes. Um, so it looks like it's all systems go, but I do take your point uh, around the timing, Councillor Cockerello, um, you know, we, we assuming that because our position is to opt out of any reforms, then we'll carry on kind of business as usual, but uh, it could change as a result of, of a mandate from our friends in the government. However, we'll uh, I, I do agree that we need to carry on with um, the works on this particular bylaw. No further comments on that one. Okay, we'll go to item 2.3, graffiti control, and um, this is a good news report. Uh, Sue, over to you. Uh Good morning, everyone. Um, David's going to do the presentation, so I'll just give him a few minutes to pop that up. Um, just a bit of a high-level um, direction here. We, we're not seeking any decisions or anything. We're just giving you a bit of an update and just informing some changes that are happening and that we may be coming back to you in the future with some new ideas. So. I'll just leave it for David to do the presentation. Over to you, David. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my screen. Council okay. briefing and graffiti control. Yes. Um, as uh, Worship said, it's a good news story to some extent. Um, it's good and bad and ugly in this story, though. Um, <laughs> Sad news to start with, I suppose, is that um, after 16 years of uh, great service to Council and the district in particular, um, our contractor who has been removing graffiti um, is no longer able to do that and continue that work. So um, we are needing to address that the gap that is being left by um, losing the good work that DTAG have been doing for 16 years. In particular, Pomari, who's shown mm -hmm. in the picture there, um, painting out some nasty graffiti. Um, the good news, I suppose, is that over the last six, seven years, the number of graffiti incidents and CRMs has been steadily reducing. 
and there's been a significant reduction. Um, the last couple of years has been a bit of an increase, but that's mainly been reported through City Safe um, and our contractors, as opposed to reported from the public. Um, there's various reasons, I think, for these declines. It's a trend that's reflected in other councils. Um, it's a trend that's potentially due to social changes, potentially due to changes in the legislation, and also potentially due to the hard work of DTAG, quickly removing tags and, and fighting the, the graffiti that way. Um, but I do like my graphs more than I like my graffiti. So um, we've also got Stop Tag, which is a database which is populated by DTAG uh, and others, uh, contractors who remove graffiti, and they record all the graffiti incidents that they remove, and that has also been steadily declining. Um, and these trends are reinforced by statistics from the police, which show that they have reduced the number of proceedings. Um, proceedings, not necessarily charges or um, enforcement actions, but just anything they've recorded as them dealing with uh, graffiti, I suppose. Um, and as you can see, it's it's been reducing now. Could say it's because they've focused on other things, it possibly is, but I think those three graphs together sort of reinforce the idea that tagging and graffiti is has over the last few years been a, a reducing problem. Um, that is not to say it is not still a problem, but what it, what it pushes me to think is that. Um, Maybe we have an opportunity to broaden the scope of what we do in this space and try and involve the community more and try and focus more on prevention, whether it's through putting spiky plants underneath bare walls or trying to get the community more involved in uh, having ownership of blank walls or introducing more murals into public spaces. Um, so it's these sort of things that have been tried in the past and I think could be worth exploring again in the future. Um, the other main driver for change, I mean, so the dr main driver for change is that we have lost our contractor um, for 16 years. The contractor may come back depending on what they decide, but that's, that's something they're pondering at the moment. Um, but what's also driving change, I suppose, is that we are um, we're finding that a large number of the graffiti jobs are on non-council assets, um, private property, some of its chorus assets, some of its um, NZTA assets. And where the jobs are on private property or where they're in the road corridor, there are health and safety and other issues that make these jobs, you know, liabilities to do with private property that make these jobs, I think, more complicated and um, It's a case that business as usual probably can't continue. So um, what we do have is, as is shown here, not all graffiti is vandalism. These are two examples of graffiti that has been encouraged by the building owners or commissioned by the building owners. Um, we also have our own murals that are commissioned, um, which is one of the potential solutions, but um, as we see here, not any solution is foolproof. Um, there's still going to be graffiti that we need to get rid of. 
some of it in a hurry when it's offensive or some of it can be very expensive when it's high up on the road corridor in dangerous locations and um, issues like that that need to be addressed so i suppose the, the idea of this briefing was to bring you up to speed on on where we're at in the graffiti space to some extent and highlight that we think that there is opportunity to look into some of these other options of um, leveraging the community involvement into improving the beautification of Whangarei um, and to get any feedback or thoughts on on how we on what should we should maybe focus on as we're looking at our options in this. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to take any questions or thoughts and and also Sue may have think, something that she wants to add to that. Thank you, David. Uh, Councillor Beanie, then Councillor Kokorulo. Yeah, um, just, just, just a couple of things. So, uh, I mean, I, I think everybody has noticed in the last couple of years the that the, the incidence of graffiti has gone down. However, I, I, I answered a little word of caution. I, I mean, I personally have noticed an increase in the last, in, in 2021 anyway. Um, and so I, I, I took the matter up with um, um, some ex-colleagues of mine, and they confirmed that there is there is an um, there is increased incidence of graffiti, um, and this, we all know that it's related to a lot of it. A lot of this is related to gangs and gang initiation and gang recruitment. Um, so I, I just I, I issued a little word of caution that uh, that if we remove this the, the this service um, that things will um, I, I I believe that this might not be a great time to remove the service I just and I'll also add that the 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 DTAG have always done a great job on um, private property and for instance fences alongside roadways uh, have always been a target and I know DTAG have just gone in and fixed it a lot of the time. Um, and and dealt with it, and I and I see a caution from you, David, that um, we've got to be careful about that sort of thing. And I believe we do have to be careful. But um, if we don't do it, who's going to? Uh, that's the issue. And same with NZTA property, so with bridges and and things like that. If we don't do it, who is going to? Um, so I, a real concern of that. So I, I I'm 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 actually. Uh, I've seen quite, it's quite evident and, and go outside Huntavasa yesterday and I see some tagging on the fencing around that um, that I haven't seen before. And I, I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hesitant to get rid of that service, to be honest. I Through agree. the chair. Um, yeah, go for it. Yes, go there's certainly caution and scepticism and, and, and a degree of worry from our side as well. Um, we have we've been very appreciative of DTAG's work, and and you know it has been like you say they've they've gone in without hesitation. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're in a position to do that because nobody was going to come back at DTAG and say, "Oh, you broke my fence." Um, however, if we have a, another contractor uh, who's more uh, liable there is potential for setting that up so um we don't we no longer have dtag as doing their great work so we need to work out another solution um and there is there's a degree of fear uh, yes but we're not quite sure what the answer is and and we don't i don't think we have the option of continuing the service as it has been done. Yeah, and, and sorry if I could just quote for you, yeah, and, 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 and I agree with you. So there is uh, options, but again, I just uh, bring the point, if we don't do it, you know, bridges and, and, and roadsides and that, if it's not our responsibility and we say we wipe our hands of it, no one is going to do it. So that's that becomes an issue. So I think, yeah, we've got to try and find an answer to that. Agreed. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Councillor Cockerillo. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, I'm glad Councillor Benny brought it up because I actually agree with him. There's, there is the de the tagging has actually increased in Ramanga, has increased in uh, heading down towards Waipu, has increased in all of these other areas. I'm noticing it immensely at the present moment. So my my big concern or question at the present moment is, what is DTAG's reason for stopping work? Is it money? Uh, no, it's, it's um, uh, illness. Okay. So with that being in mind, um, what is what is Council's alternative to DTAG? Uh, so we've got various contracts um, that include graffiti removal, for example, toilet contractors has graffiti removal in their contract, the parks contractors have graffiti removal in their contract and the roading contractors have graffiti removal on roading assets in their contract. And so where these assets are, the graffiti removal task now falls on the maintenance contractors for the for the assets properly. Okay, I appreciate that, David. But the big issue here, though, is those maintenance contractors don't do the job fast enough. For example, we could, I can report an incident which is on the state highway, which could sit there for three months before they actually do anything. And I'm a bit concerned about putting it back onto the maintenance contract where they're not actually doing their job. Indeed, so we're needing the maintenance contractors to step up um, and they've become, I think, reliant on DTAG. And so we, we have talked to the various maintenance contract managers and stressed the importance of getting onto these jobs as soon as possible. And I suppose we will see in the next few months whether whether they're able to up their game. Um, on, on that note, will there be a variance increase in their contract because of the fact that they weren't doing it and now they are doing it? Will they then be charging us more? Uh, that will vary contract to contract, I believe. Sorry, just to clarify. So you're saying it's presently written in their contract for them to do the job. Yep. They're presently being paid to do it and we may be expecting a variance and an increase in payment because they now have to do it. So I don't know, so I don't know all the maintenance contracts and um, the ones I'm aware of that it would, it would be covered under a sort of day works um, thing. So they, they'd be paid by the job to do that. Is there time delays put on the, in those contracts? Do you know if that's, that's in there? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm a reason I'm asking these questions and it, it's it, you can get where I'm going. I'm just really concerned that without DTAG or someone like DTAG with the passion to remove these tags, we will be ending up with uh, contractors who will be trying to charge us extra for doing jobs which they're already supposed to be doing. And then the job's not getting done until taking three or four months to get done when they really should be removed straight away. Indeed, the, this is, I suppose, what we're we're worried about and trying to work through, um, and we'll see where the pain points are. Simon Weston, I see your hand up. Uh, did you need to respond to that? Uh, I was just going to reiterate that um, within um, most of the contracts and, and probably the contracts that uh, Vince is referring to. Um, that the, the work's undertaken on day work, so if the work's not done, they don't get paid for that. Um, because uh, DTAG have done excellent work over the years, of course, there's been kind of little of that work that has been put through the maintenance contracts because they've been doing most of it. Um, so uh, the, the maintenance contracts, they'll just have to pick that work up and they'll be paid accordingly. But they'll be it'll be paid for through the maintenance contracts as opposed to through DTAG. Thanks, Simon. I've got Councillors Collett, Cutforth, then Murphy. Thank you. Um, just on that, I mean, coming from, this is just on that point, coming from a contracting 
point where I was given CRMs to deal with, we were told to get to them as soon as possible. Um, obviously, that had to fit in with all the other scheduled maintenance that we had to do as well. So if, depending on what area required urgency or not, it was um, you got to it when you could be able to get to it. Um, and what Simon just said as well was the fact that we've had another contractor dealing with those issues. They've not had to deal with those issues. So I, I, a lot of times I've seen people saying that's not my job because somebody else is dealing with it or we don't want to do that. Uh, even with us discussing about state highways versus um, what we control, what um, central government controls, with the fact like, well, if we do it, well, then the central government will take a take a mile and, and say, well, it's your job now. So. Uh, this contract changing up is obviously just going to change how things go. And obviously, if we don't have to pay for the contract to detag anymore, there's extra money that it can then go into the other maintenance contracts. My question was that um, I was looking through the the Auckland City's report, the the, um, the the attached file on page 61, which is also electronically 63. The Plan focus on prevention and incorporation incorporates the three E's approach, eradication, enforcement, and education. But is there any way, is there any potential looking at like a, a prevention, but within a space like where people can actually go and do that? I know people will tag on spaces because it's, it's gang related or tagging related or they're just spreading their name everywhere. I mean, right now I'm looking at a, a there's a shed across the road from me that's that's appeared a huge um, tag on it. But is there a space that would be able to be given so people could actually then go and practice tagging, do their stuff so they can actually create their art as opposed to just tagging everywhere and actually having a space? I know we contract, well, we get, we get murals and things made, but that is an option as well to, to target people, not target people, but bring people to one location so they have a space where they can. Um, even down in Christchurch, after they had the earthquakes, they had this urban, uh, technical urbanism area where they had these huge silos where people could go and practice their spray paint art and tagging and things on this space so they could actually, it, it would draw people to it so that it's a space where they were allowed to rather than it's being willy nilly wherever. And I agree, there's, it, there will never, We'll never stop at all, but it's um, it's an opportunity, I think. So I think what you're describing somewhat similar to a graffiti wall uh, idea that has been trialed previously. It seemed from what I could gather from old reports and presentations that it may have been trialed in Whangarei about nine or ten years ago. Um, it was certainly trialed in Australia. Uh, but the comment at that time was that it was not a good idea. It it allowed people to get the bug of tagging and then they went and tagged somewhere else. Um, so that, that was the, the reflection on, on those trials. I mean, like I say, I think the, the culture maybe have moved on slightly. The, Spray paints are no longer so readily available. The numbers are coming down. Maybe the attitudes are changing, but so these things could be trialed again. Um, but it seems that previous attempts at doing sim similar things to that have, have not worked out very well. Uh, just in, in, in the in the regards to the skateboard park down Riverside Drive, where that was frequently being redone and remade and people actually creating art on it where it was left for a while. I mean, you could see the, the, the layers of paint slowly building up, but it was a space where people were kind of able to do that type of thing. And I mean, even just recently, there's been a whole lot more tagging happened on it. But it's it's one of those things that I think it, the, with the, the reduction of the, the figures that you have shown, I mean, there is a potential opportunity there. But yeah, anyway, that's me. Yeah, indeed, uh, areas like the skate parks, the new bike park, um, we're going to have to make decisions about how we deal with graffiti there, you know, they are going to be hot spots and and do we try and chase our tail and remove them or, or do we leave them as graffiti free zones? Um, but th that, that's kind of issue that we need to look into a bit more and come back to council with some options and, and ideas. 
Thanks, David. Um, Councillor Cutforth, then Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, just following on from uh, Councillor Benny, I, I agree that uh, we need to we need to keep having an involvement in it. I think the idea that um, community organise or that local community organisations might step up into that role is quite frankly not going to going to work. Um, I did note in the report that I uh, just in terms of the reason that DTAG have pulled out being illness, I did note in the report that there is a potential for them to perhaps step back in in the future. So it's not actually about the lack of work, David, um, is what I'm picking. Is that right? That's not the reason they've pulled out and it's not a reason why they may not come back in. No, there's, there's, there's work there. Um, what they need to do is find, try and find somebody who's equally as passionate and also uh, didn't address some of the issues around the tightening of health and safety and uh, contractual things. You know, over the years, these things get more difficult to to contract. If you're a small contractor, it, it becomes more work than it's worth. And and they need to work out whether it is a contract that they want to have as part of their portfolio. It's not it's not their core work uh, as a trust. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they potentially want to concentrate on other things. OK, um, I just my other question was whether um, Dave Palmer had some input into this and whether it was worth having a talk to him about a potential way forward or had that been has that been done? We've certainly had a lot of discussions with Dave Palmer. Um, he's similar opinion that yes, he's very uh, worried about the consequences of losing DTAG. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're working with him and and the various options of trying to make spaces safer and less attractive to. Tagging. Thank you. Um, I think part of the attraction or the success of DTAG possibly was because it is, you know, quite a well known and respected organisation with young people. I wonder if an organisation, for example, the Otangare Trust, may also be able to step into that, into that, into that role. And just, um, just my final comment really is I agree with Nick about the idea of a tagging wall. I think that that is well worth. Um, considering at the skate park or the bike park in the future rather than not having something and just having tagging happen anyway. So, um, yeah, I just wonder if somebody like the um, Otangere Trust might be a possible option. Thank you. Thanks, Tricia. Um, Thank Councillor Murphy. Thank you. I just had a couple of brief comments and that I agree with um, Benny. And cut for. Um, I think it's good. I mean, the maintenance contracts are going to cover um, tagging on stuff that isn't private property. But most of the tagging I see is actually on, like when I drive through Tiki Ponga um, on my way home, it's on people's private fences. And I think if that if the DTAG service isn't there, um, some people sure will have the um, maybe the time and the inclination and the, the money to, to clean up their own fences. But my fear would be that, because I mean, it's private profit property, but it's still all public facing, isn't it? So often people living in those homes, they're not actually looking at the tagging. And so if they haven't, if they can't afford the paint to repaint it, or they haven't got a water blaster to clean it off, um, those tags will just sit there. So yeah, I, I agree with Gavin. I think we should definitely still be involved and um, it's actually, well, I was going to say, it's not surprising that the incidence of maybe tagging has gone down because every young person's usually got at least one phone in their hand now. <laughs> They're so busy on their devices, they, they haven't got time to get out and tag anything anymore. But anyway, thank you for bringing this conversation to us. Thanks, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, totally against this DTAG wall. Um, we might as well invite them down to 
Forum North and lay out a table of drugs and invite the gangs in and say, why not choose your weapon? Um, more common sense. I like the idea that Gavin's come up with, you know, this, we need to get on top of the graffiti, which these guys have done, and we need to stay on top of it. I might just be a little bit simplistic here, but why don't we find someone to replace the organisation that's been doing it for the last 16 years? Um, surely it's got to be in the best interest of our town and our district as a whole. Thank you, Simon. David, did, um, I, I think we'll capture all of these and wrap up at the at the end. Um, mm -hmm. Councillor Benny. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, for long-term plan, have we budgeted for this to continue in the long-term plan? Yes, it's budgeted for um, in the Parks Department for, I suppose, DTAG's ongoing contract value, which was 100 and 20,000 a year. Cool, thank you. Um, any other comments? I, I would like, I mean, I opened this up by saying it's a good news um, uh, ask, uh, item and the reduction in graffiti is definitely something to, to celebrate. I'm really sad to hear about Paul Māori. Um, I think the success in our district um, of keeping on top of graffiti, you know, lands well and truly at his feet. Um, so I'm hoping that he uh, is going to be okay. The, this contract goes through to the t June of 2022. So from my perspective, I, I'm hearing from the councillors that the general sense is that graffiti is un unwelcome in our district and we want to continue to invest in removing it where um, and, and quickly. So if that can be picked up by contracts that, that, are, that are existing and if there are areas that our contractors can pick that up through the existing contracts let's um, make sure that they are as, as skilled and as um, good in the community as Paul Marty was you know when he was out and about doing his work uh, but also that you know I, I get I'm sensing that we will continue to want to invest in this because I remember this used to be one of the major things that was reported in every infrastructure meeting was, you know, how much it was costing and everybody was horrified. Now it's just, it is business as usual and it should be. Um, but the ideas of potentially having some areas where it is accepted um, uh, needs to be explored a little further. So, um, Councillor Murphy. Oops, thank you. Um, before we finish the briefing, I just actually had a question going back to the um, the previous thing on the agenda about the water bylaw. So maybe before we finish, um, I don't know when I can ask my question. Okay, um, we've got one more item in the briefing, but do you want to ask your question around the waters now? Well, we've still hopefully got Andrew and Co still here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, I don't know if Andrew is still there. It was just at the beginning of that briefing, it said that the, um, a few minor changes may be recommended um, and any changes will be provided. And I just wanted to make sure, did I, did I miss, um, did Andrew run through what the changes were yet or or they haven't brought those to us yet? And I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss, miss a step. Yeah, hello, I, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I did, did mention a couple of the changes, but we will bring a uh, track changes document back to council for the statement of proposal so we can see all of the changes uh, in one place um, in, a, in a month or two's time. Oh, perfect. Yep. No, it was the document with the track changes. I was just wondering. Um, I'm sorry, Andrew, I, I must have I missed you um, when you were explaining that earlier. So that's good. I will look. I'll wait for that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Murphy. So, anything fi finally on uh, the graffiti item? Okay. Yes. Oh, just, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, just on this, is, um, we've got to be careful we don't send double messages here because um, I support what uh, Councillor Benny was saying. Um, way back when he, that first skateboard park opened on, on Poe Island, the, actual mayor, the mayor of the day was involved in actually encouraging that. 
uh, all the graffiti to be put actually on walls. That we actually had trials and they had an elimination process to see who'd actually get the honor of, of doing the graffiti over the skateboard park. So there's a bit of history about that being led by council and then, uh, and then we put in graffiti control, which has been really, really successful. So I'd like to keep the downward trend because I get really annoyed when I see graffiti around the place. But yeah, on one hand, council actually encouraged it. So that needs to be taken into consideration that um, some of our past actions aren't always good. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hulse. Hopefully the young people who were around at that time have matured and it's been forgotten. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so item 2.4, the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund update from, with Simon and Simon Weston and Shelley. Uh, morning, councillors. Uh, this um, item is just to explain uh, what the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund is about and um, just to give you an update on what applications were made. Um, so in um, June, the Housing Minister announced that there was going to be an Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, um, which is uh, at least $1 billion of grant funding, which is um, available for infrastructure specifically that supports housing development. Um, so we had um, a time, quite a short time period to apply. We had to apply um, by um, the, initially it was the 18th of August and then it was extended due to the COVID um, lockdown through to the 20th of August. Um, so uh, there was some guidance that came out um, around the criteria of the fund and what types of applications were, were going to be able to be made. Uh, the infrastructure was restricted to um, territorial authority type of infrastructure, so anything to do with transport, um, three waters and flood management infrastructure that specifically unlocks housing development. Um, and they were looking there at a period, um, the short to medium term period, um, is um, sort of they wanted a meaningful amount of houses within a seven year period to 2029. And, um, and then they had, um, we could say uh, over a, say a 10 year period, what the housing outcomes would be. Um, in the criteria, they had um, different tiers um, for different areas as well. So uh, Whangarei was specifically noted as a two tier two area, which meant that we had to have applications that supported a minimum of 100 houses. Um, it was expected generally that the TAs would be um, the applicants um, because we would own and operate the infrastructure, but private developers and Māori entities were also able to apply, um, but they were expected to be um, liaising with councils about the infrastructure. Um, so we don't have visibility of any private applications that were put in um, to the fund. This is purely the ones that were um, applied for by council. Um, along with um, the criteria, there's an expectation that the developers and landowners would contribute their fair share to the process. Now that could be through either paying of development contributions that um, were already planned for those areas uh, or by them su supplying land for the infrastructure or some other means or cash um, type of contributions as well. Um, but it was clear that this fund was not to replace any existing um, projects that we had in our long-term plan that were already funded, whether by um, capital or uh, development contributions. Uh, so this fund is administered by Kainga Ora. And they have run it as a multi-stage multi tendering style of process. So we had to submit through Tenderlink. Um, the first stage is an expression of interest, which is the one that closed um, in August. And um, you can see a little diagram on your um, sheet there, which um, has a timeline. Uh, so the EOIs were the first step. And then between... Um, if we are successful at the EOI stage, we would move on to a request for proposal stage, and that would be happening between October and December. If we are successful at that stage, then we would be asked to move into the negotiating stage. 
um, and then going into a final decision making stage with ministers. Uh, so that um, is quite a long process from March through to October. So um, if we are uh, successful at moving through the stages, that then we may not have an outcome, a final outcome until uh, um, over a year away. Uh, so there were criteria that had to be met um, to make these applications and there's a scoring regime attached to those. So they will be assessed by um, Kainga Ora um, at, for, <clears throat> for how well the proposal meets uh, these housing criteria. Uh, so there are um, weightings attached. You'll see the housing outcomes has 40% weighting, uh, the impact of funding 20%, cost and co-funding 20%, and the capability and readiness 20%. So in terms of the applications that um, Whangarei District Council put in, um, there's one for the Port Nikau area. Um, so we work closely with the developer there to um, put together a proposal which is based around their precinct A, uh, precinct one, uh, which is delivering 440 houses uh, between 2024 and 2031. Um, and the, uh, the infrastructure, though, ultimately supports um, the delivery of around 1,100 houses plus some mixed-use commercial and commercial development. Uh, that obviously would take a longer period of time to, um, to realise. The funding that's requested is 38.836 million, um, and it's for upgrading of Port Road from the bridge, which is already underway. Um, and includes the Port Kiora Road intersection. Um, and that would turn that into a four lane arterial ro um, road with a separate shared path um, and the usual services and landscaping that goes along with that. Um, there's also a shared path um, and some trunk water and wastewater mains um, within the development uh, or to service the development. Uh, we've just having a look right now at the impact of the Waka Kotahi um, funding and whether or not the um, amount that we requested could be reduced um, now that we have some certainty um, around what what projects are funded by Waka Kotahi. Uh, the next application is for um, a development called Weddell Farm. Um, this one is located um, off Morningside Road and Kortata Rise and runs down towards um, Limeburners Creek. Um, it's about a uh, 20 hectare property um, and would deliver around 150 houses. We don't have an exact number just yet, um, but some of the infrastructure also supports a further 75 houses um, on another development site, um, which is just a bit to the, um, just on the eastern boundary. Uh, so what we've asked for there in terms of funding is 6.148 million, um, which is for a road that um, provides a link that we may not otherwise get through normal subdivision conditions, uh, a shared path alongside Limeburners Creek, and then also a wastewater pump station in Rising Main um, that would cross um, Limeburners Creek over to Kiora Road, and that, that replaces a pump station that's further up the hill. Uh, the third application is for um, the Ruakaka Marsden One Tree Point area. Um, this one is looking at the um, infrastructure required for wastewater, the wastewater treatment plant, and the new coastal outfall from that wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the funding requested there is forty-four point seven million, uh, and that obviously is um, a constraint to growth in that particular area. Uh, the other application is for Springs Flat, um, which is for a, a roundabout on State Highway 1 um, at the end of Springs Flat Road. And there's a new road link that would be made to Alcoba Street. Um, and the bridge at the end of Gillingham Road would be two laned. Um, and there's also included a shared path link from Station Road. Uh, so the funding requested for that one is um, 10.4 million um, and the um, estimate there is that it would open up um, 500 hectares of land for subdivision. 
Uh, and finally, there's an application um, for the Sands Road area, which involves a new roundabout on Nungaru Road at the Sands Road intersection. Um, this is to service some, um, some proposed subdivisions for 96 lots and 112 lots. Uh, and that funding request is for $2 million. Um, and as you see there, there's also um, a shared path link that would connect the roundabout to the rest of the shared path network. Um, thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Shelley. That's very complicated. I've got Councillors Hulse and then Reid. Yeah, Shelley, um, just going back to the, line, the one on Morningside Road, uh, it's interesting, there's quite a number of houses there, but there's no mention of widening Morningside Road itself, because that's a, that's a real narrow road all the way up through there. Um, I'm not aware of a need for upgrading of Morningside Road. Um, I would have to um, ask Jeff about whether that is part of the um, growth plans for that area or not. Well, if you, it's, it's quite annoying in one sense, because on one thing, we're meant to be looking ahead and planning for a 30 year horizon. And yet the top of Morningside Road has got speed bumps every 20, 25, 50 metres, just to slow the traffic down because the road is not wide enough. And here we are proposing new subdivision drop for the same road. So there needs to be a bit of consistency here. That's all I'm bringing up. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Councillor Reid, then Councillor Innes, and Councillor Peters. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Shelley, just if you like, I'll, I've got a little bit of feedback on, on some of these. I can do the whole lot together or one at a time, if you like. Um, Port Nikau, four laning Port Road, is going to help the traffic there, but then we pour them onto two lane roads. Um, i.e. Kiori or Rera Rewa. Um, I think we seriously need to have a link on the south end of town. Toto Road is probably the obvious choice through to link into Port Nikau, and that will relieve the congestion on Rera Rewa and Kiori or and on that roundabout because, uh, yeah. Four laning down there is is only going to be a stopgap measure for the the situation we have right now, not including adding four hundred and forty odd homes to start with. Um, now, as Councillor Hulse has explained with the Weddell Farm, you've got Morningside Road, which has it's a slow speed street with numerous humps. It's not overly wide. And the other option they have is Anzac Road, which is even narrower, has no um, slow speed street installation and is like a racetrack at the moment. And then you get to the bottom and at 8.30 in the morning or quarter past eight, you cannot get across that intersection for love nor money. Um, so we need to take the blinkers off and, and take everything in a wider scope there. Um, the others, I'll wait until somebody else has had the opportunity to speak, but if you could give us a bit of feedback on that would be cool. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, so as far as these applications go, um, it was purely looking at the infrastructure that might be a constraint to the delivery of housing at PACE. Um, it was not around um, looking at any impacts on the wider transport network. Uh, this, um, the, the issues you raised around, uh, say, Port Nikau um, are dealt with in terms of the infrastructure strategy, the transport strategy, um, which identifies any future strategic links that may need to be made to support growth um, and to deal with any traffic issues within the district. Um, and similarly for Morningside Road, um, as those developments um, are assessed through the resource consenting process, they would have um, traffic assessments undertaken to make sure that um, roading networks were made safe um, to cater for the um, increased demand.
Thanks, Shelley. I see um, both Simon and Calvin had their hands up as well, Simon Weston. Um, did you want to add to that? Um, thank you, through through the chair. Um, for that particular um, application, uh, the Weddell Farm application, there will be a link road that will be built um, that, that links uh, the Kotata Heights Road through to Morningside Road, and that's kind of part of the um, part of the application, and that will run through that that new part of that subdivision. So hopefully that will take some of the loading um, off of Morningside Road. But um, I, I agree with you in regards to um, the congestion down at State Highway One, and um, and also at the Riva Riva intersection. And uh, there are some plans to improve that intersection. And uh, Calvin may well want to comment on that. He can. Sorry. Um, through the chair, yeah, I was initially going to provide similar con comments to what Shelley and um, Simon said regarding the, the difference between this funding and the long term um, strategy for transport. Um, I guess in terms of intersections, the, the only one I can really comment on in, in particular at the moment is of, uh, the Port Nikau um, Kiora Road um, area where the latest funding release indicates that it's um, what they term as prob um, probable to be approved. Um, and what that means is that depending on a sufficient business case, the money has been set aside to fund that intersection. So that's related to the um, bridge upgrade that's happening at the moment, so stage two of that. So um, all things being equal, that funding has been secured. Just a quick one there, Calvin. Does that include the cost of the roundabout that's going to link that piece with... Um, so, so with, whether it be a roundabout or a T intersection still needs to be determined on final design through the business case and ultimately is determined by Kiwi Rail's requirements. I think Jeff provided that update previously. So, yep. But the funding is for an intersection upgrade, um, which the cost estimates, as I believe, cover either of those options. Thanks, Gilman. Uh, Councillor Innes, then Councillor Peters, Murphy and Hobbs. You're on mute, Greg. Thank you. Uh, oh, Shelley, I was wanting to uh, discuss Port Nico. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar years ago with the discussions that we had with the Northern Harbour Board, uh, who were developers, and uh, and in the end, we were able to get an Esplanade Reserve, which is now the Hatia Loop. But uh, at the start of those discussions, that wasn't going to happen. So I'm just interested in that uh, precinct, uh, uh, number one precinct that you talk about. Is there a discussion that's going on uh, in terms of the contribution that we're asking for here and uh, financial contributions uh, by the developer because uh, I see that uh, access along the uh, uh, the harbour edge there will be quite significant in the future in terms of the amenity of uh, that area. Just going back and looking at the Hatia loop now uh, from those discussions that were about uh, 30 or getting on to almost 40 years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, so in terms of the Port Nikau, um uh, zoning rules in the district plan, um, there are not any requirements for um, Esplanade reserves in those particular areas. Um, some of that is because of the marine based activities um, on the on the um, eastern side. Uh, but in terms of the rest of the area, there were still no Esplanade requirements. However, the developer has designed in um, a network of um, sort of harbour side um, reserves that are proposed to have shared paths um, and the likes to be able to walk around the entire development. 
there is um, not all of those areas um, are included in this application. Uh, we've only focused on precinct one, which is quite a substantial portion. Uh, but the um, there are other discussions that the developer has been having with um, other parties and council around a developer agreement and the extent of parks land um, and any potential for um, offsets of contributions. Those discussions are, don't form a part of this application for funding because parks um, related infrastructure is not included in the funding criteria. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley. Councillor Peters. Um, thank you for this. My understanding is this fund is specifically targeted towards increasing affordable housing. In your application, have any of these sites been connected with increasing affordable housing? Um, thank you, Carol. Um, not the, the criteria um, and the application form ask for information about whether um, affordable housing is intended for the area and whether there are any arrangements in place. Um, none of these areas have any existing arrangements in place, um, but the developer for Weddell Farm had been um, having some initial conversations about the potential for um, affordable housing in that particular area. Um, so the, the, the fund does not specifically require affordable housing to be delivered. Yes, but um, the indication that we have is that where the funding will go will be to councils that have shown that the funding will be used to increase affordable housing. Even though it's not a criteria, uh, I understand that is a focus of this this fund. So if another council is able to show connection with the increase of affordable um, housing, they're more likely to attract the fund. That's that's my understanding. Um, that, that may um, be how it gets assessed, but in terms of what we were told in the application and the guidelines, um, it didn't require that to be the case, but we cannot say how they may assess it. If there are um, future discussions in the next little while about affordable housing that connects with these developments, have we the opportunity to forward that to the assessment committee? I suppose that we um, we could do. Um, it's really up to those developers to to make those arrangements themselves. Um, it's yeah, it's, it would be quite difficult for us to become directly involved in um, in ensuring that there was affordable housing outcomes from some of these developments at this point in time. Uh, but that's not to say that we may not. Um, have those discussions if we get to the next stage of this process. Thanks, Shirley. Councillor Murphy, then Councillor Hulse. Thanks, Shirley. Um, it's really interesting looking at the list of um, proposals. I am really surprised, though, that um, Port Nico is still being considered for mm -hmm. housing. Um, it's a it's a flood prone area and I just think it's really bizarre that we would um, allow or even promote the fact that housing should be built somewhere um, so close to sea level. So I'm just wondering on, about your comments on that. The other thing is that you'd think Kaying Aura, and I'm sure they will be, they will be looking um, not only, like Carol said, for proposals that increase um, the stock of affordable housing, but also for developments where the housing is well connected to public transport networks. And I see your applications mention things like connections to our um, shared path network and stuff, but it would also make a lot of sense when you think about, um, you know, with Greenfield subdivision, 
they need to be connected, um, well, the closer they are, even to rail. I know we're not using rail for commuter at the moment, but I would say within the next 20 to 30 years, we will be again. So subdivisions maybe around the Springs flat area um, aren't far from the, the um, rail network because we just can't go on developing like we have in the past. It's just kind of business as usual thinking. Um, and I'm not having a go at our staff. We need places for people to live. But that's why, I mean, our council policy is to increase inner city housing. And that's what we have to do. So I'd be really interested to know if we've, you know, have we looked at places as close to the CBD as possible, which could provide affordable housing and also um, could provide opportunities for people to live car free. Um, that's the way of the future. So yeah, any comments on those would be good. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anna. Uh, so yes, the um, application asked for information about the proximity to public transport, um, to other amenities, uh, to work areas, um, and a whole range of other things. Uh, so yes, that is a part of the consideration. Um, because the criteria was for housing developments of a minimum of 100 houses, um, it would be very difficult to achieve that within um, the city centre area. And you have to have a developer who is um, ready and willing to build the housing um, or can make arrangements to build the housing um, within that 10 year period. So um, it, we were quite restricted in terms of which developers um, were ready and could fit that criteria. Uh, as far as the um, uh, flood risk of Port Nikau, that has been addressed through the uh, district plan zonings. Um, so they are raising up the uh, level of the land where the housing developments um, go, and they have a methodology um, approved from geotechnical engineers to, to make that happen. Um, so these areas are already um, zoned for development within the district plan, um, and those types of matters would get assessed as they go through the consenting regime. That's good, Shelley. Hey, just one more thing, I guess, listening to, so what's the definition of, I mean, housing though? So when they say new houses, I mean, do we, they must also, like an apartment or apartment buildings must come within that definition? Because a house doesn't have to be, you know, like a, a house, standard type of house it could be a an a, a apartment building couldn't it yes absolutely it could be an apartment building okay i've got councillors Hulse, cooper and cutforth and um, bearing in mind that we've uh, also got a workshop at one o'clock and we all need to get off our chuffs so yeah, I'll, make, I'll make mine pretty short uh, good luck shelly um there's always problems we into this, but I just want to reinforce some of the things that uh, Councillor Reid brought up because he's a truck driver. Every one of these roads has got to be able to have a truck go up and down and deliver goods and, and everything else. So we should be listening to some of the in, enterprise around the table. My concern is going back to Puri Park. We we got a new housing development with the local knowledge was totally discounted, and I sat through that hearing. It is totally discounted in the, in the sense that, oh, we're a government agency. What could Kotahi is a government agency? We don't have to talk to anyone. We'll just bulldoze it through. So in essence, they're passing their problems onto our council, making our council look really, really dumb. And I'm not going to tolerate that type of behaviour. I'm going to fight that as much as I can. So we need to be really brave and, and just stick out. And the council has brought up a really good point just a while ago. You know, our long-term planning is done for a reason and it's just totally discarded by these government departments at the moment so that's all i want to say so thank you thanks council house councillor cooper my topics have been covered thank you that's a cut forth uh just yeah just a quick question on the sands road um roundabout uh, i was just wondering the sh it talks about the shared path link connecting the roundabout to the city's shared path network and i just wondered what that meant? Um, I would have to find out exactly. I don't have precise um, details about 
what that would be, but I imagine that it is um, to do with the connection through to um, the network that's around Whangarei Falls. I'd be interested to know if it actually is going to help connect um, through to Punariri Drive and to the Kamo Shed Path, rather than the um, little path that we've put through the trees. That's so. In terms of the proper shared path network, is what I'm interested in. Thank you. Um, I would have to get advice from uh, Transport about their plans for that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, um, and thank you for the work that you've done in liaising with uh, with developers. There's met lots of water to flow under these bridges to see whether we even get past the expression of interest stage, then the request for a proposal, and then hopefully. Um, Hello, Ken speaking. Hello, Ken. Here at Wealth Point North and Kerry. Kerry, how are you? Oh, good, Ashley. Thank um, you. Ken, Ken Cooper, can you put? Oh, I'm going to mute him. Hang on. Um, so well, this morning it's all good. Hopefully that's muted him. Um, thank you, team. So yeah, uh, these projects uh, have got to to this point of expression of interest. Sorry, everybody. And um, we'll we'll fingers crossed that we can actually get some infrastructure provided to provide some more housing. Um, all all the best, Shelley Kikaha, for the next steps. So, uh, team, that's us for the uh, the briefing. As I say, we've got a workshop commencing at one, and I've got um, about a list of about 100 phone calls that I need to make in between now and then. So I'll say goodbye for now. See you then.